we would have made the Al Green film before the reggae film, but um, it took me 13 months to convince Al to do it. I went twice to Memphis, once to New York, and once to New Orleans trying to meet him and talk him into it. And I knew he was having in um, a week, the week before Christmas of 1983, I knew he was having, uh, he was a preacher now at his own church in Memphis. And I had heard that he was gonna be doing his seventh anniversary service. And I had read that uh, in the Southern Black Fundamentalist Church, mm -hmm. that that's considered the preacher's day, the seventh anniversary. So I thought, oh, we gotta do this. And I found out he was gonna have two choirs and a bunch of his musicians and all this. Mm -hmm. So uh, we finally convinced him just days before we had to be down there to shoot. And the only way, the only way um, I was able to convince him finally was my, my deal with Channel 4 in England would be I would get 30% of the profits. While, so I offered him 10, so he'd get a third. Mm -hmm. And so he would not say yes until I'd convince them to give him more of an advance and to give him the entire 30%. Mm -hmm. So I finally had to go back to Channel 4 and beg them to give me 40% so I could at least have 10. Look, I need you, oh. I want you, I can't help it, I need you, oh, with all my, yeah, I love that, I love it, with all my heart, yeah. Al Green's like a whole different yeah, kind of thing because, yeah, yeah, because he yeah. grew up with that black fundamentalist southern church where, okay, you're either doing the music of, the, of God or you're doing the music of the devil. Mm -hmm. And he was, his, his crises came from his becoming a success in soul music mm -hmm. and, um, and him getting all this money and getting all these women and, and then starting to do the alcohol and the drugs and stuff and then starting to like fall off the stage and, uh, and then having that woman shooting, um, allegedly, you know, we'll throw grits hot on grits on him and then shoot and kill herself and all that. Um, well, he tells that story in your film. He does. That was the first time he had ever told it. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, I had, I had, while we were shooting him in Memphis, I was trying and trying to get him to sit down for an interview. And I, was, we're, I suggested we do it in his office. That studio was attached to his office, the studio where we shot the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And um, I finally, I also, you know, couldn't get him to do his old hits because he was refusing to do them anymore. He'd gone all in for the religion. And so I finally said, Al, would you do a, let us shoot a, you know, do kind of a pretend rehearsal? And, and so then he did some of the religious songs. I said, God, I'd love to hear Let's Stay Together. <laughs> I just knew I could not make that film without a performance of Let's Stay Together. I knew it was going to be this motif running through the whole film. The breakup with Willie Mitchell, all that. Let's stay together. Let's not, uh, you know, not st going from one musical genre to another, all this stuff. And so he said, okay. So you, you see him in the film teaching the background singers the backup part. And then, uh, and I had to sit there on camera to be totally blase about it rather than, <laughs> I got him to do this. <laughs> We just had the one steady cam uh, shot. It was a different cameraman, but um, but so then after we filmed the interview, I, I'm sorry, the rehearsal. He said, "So you want to film that interview?" And I said, "What here?" 
He said, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. So we had to quickly move the lights and everything. But, you know, like some, some of the different musicians, including Larry Lee, who uh, I think that's his name, right? Who, who played with Gil Scott Heron, I mean, with um, Jimi Hendrix's Band of Gypsies and stuff. And he had told a story about going to England with him um, with, um, uh, right after Let's Stay Together and coming home, and he's this huge star after Let's Stay Together. But anyway, those guys sat there in the studio listening to this two-hour interview we did because he talked about things he had never talked about before, including the hot grits incident. Yeah, well, you see, you mix this stuff in and make it kind of slimy thick, you know? And I'm saying, like, what is this, you know? And all of a sudden, I'm full of it, you know? So this is so much pain, man. And I reach back, man, and I got a, two fingers full of skin. We ran out of film in the middle of his telling the story, and thank God he agreed to, uh, to sit there and I just kept like engaging him, talking until audio. we got the ne next magazine loaded and back on the camera. And then you actually see the cameraman walking across as we got it set up again. When Andy Park asked me to make the film, he made me put myself into the film. And um, I didn't like it. And finally, uh, uh, when I showed it at the, uh, it was called uh, Film X. It was a festival in LA at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had two huge screenings of it there. Sybil Shepherd even showed up at, at uh, one of them uh, at the time. And uh, people started to snicker with these sequences I put in with myself and, um, you know, sitting at my editing table musing on, on um, religious music of different types and, mm. and, um, and religious art. And so I said... I got up at the end and I said, thank you for showing me the parts that got to be cut. And Andy finally let me cut those out. He gave me a history of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want this to be from the European perspective, this film. So I want you to know the history of Christianity from a European viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So I read this book. It was actually very good. It didn't really tell me anything I needed for that film. But so I had to go to Howard University and get a couple of um, advisors mm -hmm. to speak on film about these issues. So I interviewed two men, uh, a white guy who was a, a professor of comparative religion mm -hmm. and, and an African-American guy who headed the chorus there. Mm -hmm. And they each had great things to say, but those were the other times where people snickered. Mm -hmm. They didn't want any of us telling about Sun Ra, I mean, Al Green, they wanted Al Green telling about Al Green. Right, which is the genius thing that I like about your films, that that you're giving voice to people. Uh, you know, pr I mean, prior to the 70s, documentaries were always about narration and voiceover and things like that. And they still are. I mean, so much of the, so much of the time, it's like voice of God narration and everything, and I don't care about that guy. I want these people, and um, now... I have, there, there have been occasions where I felt the need to have um, people to act as guides, mm -hmm. like Bob Palmer, music critic Bob Palmer in Deep Blues. Mm -hmm. And in Rhythm and Bayous, I have several music historians um, mm -hmm. that kind of help introduce you to, uh, that's Rhythm and Bayous, a roadmap to Louisiana music. So mm -hmm. they help guide you through these different parts of the state with these different musical genres. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the most part, I try to just let the musicians tell us. And sort of a direct similar thing. I mean, was Penna Baker a, a big inspiration? Or? Uh, somewhat, yeah. I mean, I, I loved, I, I would have edited it differently, but I love Don't Look Back with Bob mm -hmm. Dylan and Monterey Pop and, and uh, a lot of the other things he did. And and it was funny when uh, when I uh, almost got to work with Stephen Sondheim years ago before uh, before he decided that um, they were ha he and his collaborators were too much in conflict and he decided that um, they needed to be able to say tough things to each other and mm -hmm. he finally got to be afraid that if cameras were there he wouldn't be uh, in the in for the mm -hmm. pr 
lead up to the make to the Broadway production of Sunday in the Park with George. So we finally had to give it up. Right. But um, uh, stylistic approach, Penna Baker. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Muscles. And when when I was talking to him about the um, what what we would do in the making of the film, I sent him a couple of my previous films, and he sent me a couple of films he had liked that had been mm -hmm. done on his work. And one of them was Penna Baker's. A, a film about the recording of the soundtrack album for Company. Mm -hmm. And Pennebaker, of course, was all in for direct cinema, our, um, our American version, North American version of uh, Cinema Verite in France. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, al I always took a little bit of that. But to me, early on when I first started making films, to me it was all about that was all about shaky camera, out of focus, mm -hmm. um, sitting through long stretches that didn't really tell me much, but may have been fun, more fun for the maker than mm -hmm. for the watcher. Mm -hmm. But that said, hugely respected, Penna Baker, Fred Wiseman, Leacock, um, you know, down the road, Barbara Koppel, all yeah. kinds of people. Couple. I'm sorry? Mazels. Mazels, absolutely, yeah. Huge, huge fan of Salesman and um, uh, uh, Grey Gardens and all those kinds of things. Uh, and, and Give Me Shelter, oh my God, you know, masterpiece. Yeah. So, so, but giving voice, I mean, so when we look at these things, like, I, you know, 20, 30 years after the fact, I look at... Uh, your work with Gil Scott Heron and Al Green and stuff. And I always say, well, you know, like this is like the first time you get to see these genius and Sun Ra, of course, these geniuses actually representing themselves, not being told through a filter. Like, um, it's so frustrating. You know, I got into this whole thing with uh, Dick Gregory about uh, Miles Davis, you know, how his, his legacy was disrespected by the filmic interpretation and, you know, the fact that they had to in insert a fake white character to help tell Which the story. Which is inevitably what happened. <coughs> traditionally happened in the f fiction films about black culture mm -hmm. is let us have a white, you know, even Mississippi burning, you know, mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta do it through the, the white FBI guys mm -hmm. viewpoint, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we have come a long way, but there's still some of that crap. And, and yes, that even though, you know, it's funny that recent Miles Davis feature mm -hmm. that actually largely came out of a script that was written by a friend of mine in Hollywood and his partner who they 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 did the uh, they wrote the film on Muhammad Ali that Michael Mann did they mm -hmm. they wrote the film on Nixon um, the one just called Nixon mm -hmm. Oliver, um, Stone, right? Oliver Stone and uh, and so they had written a script for this and Don Cheadle was supposed to be in that film but Don Cheadle <laughs> kind of just went, and went made off with the estate and did his own script and his own very different approach, obviously. And his approach, too, is controversial, just as theirs probably would have been controversial. But I still haven't seen it. I was here, little hill, the womb. It My name is Bob Muggy, and you are watching Real Black with the incomparable Mike D.